the topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, its IRS structure, so internal ribosomal entry site structure. Um, and it's something that uh, I first got interested in uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, where I worked on uh, foot and mouth disease virus. And so the foot and mouth disease virus has an unusual way of translating its viral genome. Uh, and, uh, and I thought this was fascinating. Um, and it's something that I've followed on uh, during my postdoc and now into my own lab as well that I've set up. So I thought I'd start with just a brief overview of the uh, normal canonical translation initiation in the cell. So this process starts, uh, basically the most rate controlling step of translation is at the initiation stage. And the first thing that happens is you have a formation of what's called the ternary complex. And so this is a complex of init uh, initiation factor two with initiator tRNA and GTP. All right, so this ternary complex is then recruited to the 40S small ribosomal subunit. And this process is stimulated by these other initiation factors, EIF3, which is a large 13 subunit uh, complex, and then the proteins EIF1 and 1A, which are much smaller proteins. But together, they form what's referred to as the 43S complex. Okay? So this 43S complex is then recruited to the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA. But the messenger RNA first has to be so-called activated. Okay? And this happens through recognition of the cap structure at the 5' prime end of the RNA, which is recognized by the 4E protein, which is all part, which is a, a part of the larger EIF4F complex. Right? So this EIF4F complex, which contains an RNA helicase, which relaxes the structure at the 5' prime end of the RNA to activate the, uh, to activate the RNA for translation. So it's believed that an interaction between EIF3 and this 4G subunit of EIF4F is what pulls or recruits the 43S complex to the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA. And once it's bound there, it then scans down the 5' prime UTR, the 5' prime untranslated region, until it reaches the first AUG, which is in good context, and recognizes this with codon, codon, uh, base, uh, codon anticodon base pairing and the formation of a stable 48S complex, which is shown here. So this complex here is a very stable complex and without any extra factors to start the next stage of translation, this won't go anywhere. Okay? So this is a very, very stable complex here. All right? And so we can detect this complex using different systems. And so that's what I'm going to, and, and basically by detecting this complex, we can see what protein factors are needed for translation on particular RNAs. All right? And so, uh, so it's important to realize, since this is a virology talk, uh, that this is, the this is the background that viruses need to translate their genomes in. Okay, so viruses don't bring any translation factors. They need to use all the translation factors in the cells that they infect in order to produce viral proteins for replication. All right, so the viruses have to be able to somehow compete with the cellular system to produce, their viral, or, uh, to produce viral proteins. All right? And so in a number of cases, there's well-described uh, mechanisms that viruses use to, to compete with viral RNA. For example, some picornaviral pro uh, um, Picornaviral proteases, like from polio virus or from foot and mouth disease virus, they're able to cleave this EIF4G protein. All right? And what, that ha what happens is it separates the EIF4E binding component of 4G. All right? And so if, now if that's cut, this protein can no longer promote cap-dependent or cellular-dependent translation. And so the virus, uh, the virus translation, which proceeds in a mechanism independent of this, which I'll describe in a little while, is able to preferentially produce viral proteins. Okay, so this is one, one pretty well described uh, mechanism. So what became apparent was that uh, a number of viral RNAs didn't adhere to this kind of this sort of canonical translation initiation mechanism. All right? And so shown here is the 5' UTR of uh, EMCV. So the EMCV is a positive sense single-stranded RNA virus. So that means the viral genome once it enters the cell, it can be directly translated into the viral proteins for replication. All right? But as you can see here, this is a very, very long 5' UTR, and there's a number of ATGs, or AUGs, so star potential star codons. But none of these are recognized. All right? And this star codon of the viral polyprotein is this ATG here. Okay? So this didn't make sense. Secondly, 
it was known that the viral, pro the viral RNA genomes also had a protein, a viral protein linked to the 5' prime end. So they didn't have this sort of cap structure in order to recruit, uh, to recruit the ribosome. And finally, as I'd mentioned, this protein EIF4G was cleaved during infection with these viruses. So all this pointed to something that was different about how these viruses translated their genomes. And it became clear that, uh, that these 5' UTRs were very highly structured. And it turns out that these elements are now, now referred to as IRESs, so internal ribosomal entry sites, are highly structured RNAs that are able to recruit the ribosome to an internal location. So it becomes 5' end independent. Okay? And so it's these IRESs that I'm going to talk to you about today. So this is, this, the first IRES was, is, uh, was identified in around 1988 and then very quickly after, in poliovirus, and then very quickly after that, other viruses were shown to have similar mechanisms. But, so these are the four main classes of IRES that have been described to date. So we've got, uh, so this is the type one, the coronavirus IRES, uh, which is about 450 nucleotides long, and this is found in uh, enteroviruses, such as poliovirus or EV71. And then the type two, the coronavirus IRES, which is found in EMCV, as I showed you, but also in the foot and mouth disease virus, IRS, uh, foot and mouth disease virus. Now, a number of other classes, so uh, shown here is the dicistral virus uh, intergenic region, IRES. So this is a very, very simple piece of RNA structure that directly recruits the ribosome, the 40S subunit, because it folds up in a way that mimics the tRNA that starts uh, translation of the, of, uh, that typically starts translation. Okay, so this is the cricket uh, uh, paralysis uh, virus IRS. And then here, this is the hepatitis C virus like family of IRSs. Okay, and so we know a little bit about how these work as well. So they recruit this big EIF3 subunit uh, in order to recruit the ribosome directly. Okay, so what I'm going to focus on today are these two guys here. So the type 1 and the type 2 coronavirus IRSs. So, uh, So the, uh, there are a number of key questions that we, want, that are, we think are very interesting about IRESs. First of all, of course, how do these elements work? Right? So how do these uh, big structured RNAs, how are they able to recruit the 40S ribosome to an internal location in order to get around this 5' cap dependence? Do different IRESs, okay, that, so as I showed you, and we'll go into a bit more detail, they look quite different in their secondary structure. But do they share common mechanistic features? Is there something that IRESs need to do to be able to recruit to an internal location? And we know that some IRESs have altered activity in, in different cell types. Okay? And so this uh, leads into trying to understand the pathogenicity of some viruses. For example, is there a reason why uh, poliovirus or EV71 infects neuronal cells and causes, uh, causes uh, poliomyelitis-like symptoms? Can we try and understand if that's dependent on translation regulation? All right. So the outline of the talk today, so I'm going to focus on initially on work uh, that was done to try and understand how the type 2 IRES uh, from the coronaviruses work, so from EMCV. And to do that, I'm going to describe an in vitro reconstitution system. So this is a system I was set up in the lab in Cambridge, and we're studying uh, translation regulation there. Uh, but it's a very powerful system uh, that was used to really kind of get down to the nuts and bolts of how these IRESs work. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, about translation factors that are required for these IRESs but also the identification of extra proteins. So proteins that are not normally involved in translation regulation, but are usurped by the virus in order to promote uh, uh, virus translation in the, in the cell. Then I'll go on and uh, I'll talk about the, uh, compare this to the type 1 the coronavirus system and see, look at some similarities and differences between the two. And then finally, we'll look at uh, some variations on these themes, which actually is, makes us think differently about how these irises are actually working and trying to get to the bottom of the mechanistic basis of how they function. So this in vitro reconstitution system takes quite a while to set up because there's a lot of protein purification involved. So we start off with a, a large volume of rabbit reticulocyte lysate. Uh, and from that, we purify the uh, 40S ribosomal subunits 
And these uh, native initiation factors, EIF2, EIF3, and EIF4F. So as I mentioned, for example, EIF3 is made up of 13 different subunits. To actually express these subunits individually in E. coli and to get them to reassemble into a functional complex, basically we haven't been able to do that yet. And so really sourcing these complexes from these lysates is uh, currently what all we can do. So the factors that we can express recombinantly, the small uh, initiation factors like EIF1, EIF1A, EIF4A, we do. So we express as many as we can in E. coli to try and minimize the amount of lysate we have to use. And then we also purify and synthesize, uh, synthesize and purify initiator tRNA. Okay? So we make that uh, recombinantly in, in the lab as well. So all of these things then we can add into, uh, into a reaction mixture with an in vitro transcribed RNA of interest. All right? So this RNA, we can modify the RNA to look at the role of specific sequences, specific structures in the RNA, and see how these mutations affect the requirement for different initiation factors. So then we can start to pull apart how the IRS is recruiting these translation factors. All right? And so once we've assembled these complexes in the test tube, so as I mentioned, what we're looking at is the formation of these 48S complexes, and they're very stable, okay? And so they sit on the, on the star code and that's been selected. And so because they're so stable, we can analyze them in different ways. So we can use sucrose density gradients, footprinting, hydroxyl radical cleavage, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, cryo-EM, uh, cryo we've made some beautiful complexes to, to look at these structures using cryo-EM, but also uh, another technique called toe printing, all right? And so a lot of the gels that I'm going to show you uh, are these toe printing gels, okay? So just to give you a quick uh, overview of how these work, uh, so we assemble our reaction, and so now if you picture what's happening inside the test tube, we've got an RNA with a star code on, okay? And so if we now add in a radio-labeled primer with reverse transcriptase, the reverse transcriptase will now make a cDNA copy that's P32 labeled that's going to go all the way to the 5' end of the RNA, all right? And so that's going to be a full length signal, all right? Now, in the second condition, if we now have formed a stable 48S complex on this RNA. When we do the same RT reaction, we generate a truncated cDNA product, all right? And you can see here, it's called a toe print because it's where the RNA, or the ribosome, is sitting on the RNA. So it's going to be on it like that, and the RT is going to go back, but it's going to stop here. So it's not going to stop exactly the ATG because some of the ribosome is protecting a, 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 a section of the RNA, okay? So this is why we call it a toe print. So this is just a schematic of what one of these gels would look like. You can see here we've got our full length signal in condition one. We've got no complex. But then when we have complex, we get these additional stops. Okay? And this is uh, just separated on a, a denaturing, ST, uh, uh, sorry, denaturing uh, page gel. But you can see here that the toe print is actually 15 to 17 nucleotides downstream from the ATG. All right? So that's, if, we're, if we're seeing efficient translation, that's where we're going to see a product, okay? And so, first of all, we're just going to look at these uh, two irises, these, these uh, classes of virus. So we're going to focus first on the type 2 picornavirus iris because this was the first to be really well studied using this in vitro reconstitution system. So overall, between these two structures, there's very, there's basically there's no sequence or structural similarity between these two classes of iris, okay? Between the type 1 and the type 2. The only thing that seems to be conserved between them, or that is conserved between them, is this polypyrimidine tract just downstream of an AUG. All right? And this AUG, in the case of uh, uh, the type 1 IRSs, is typically not the starting codon. All right? But it's, there's always an AUG there. And instead, the start codon can be up to 100 nucleotides or more downstream from where the IRS is. All right? In contrast, for the type uh, one, uh, for the type two irises, this star codon typically is the actual star codon for the virus. All right, uh, but apart from that, there's very little, uh, there's very little cons conservation between the two. The other thing to mention is that there's a very highly conserved GnRA loop in these uh, irises, and in the case of the type one I uh, uh, iris, it's located here. 
and you always have this GNRA loop sequence, all right? And if you mutate it away from this GNRA sequence, you lose IRES activity, all right? Similarly, there's a GNRA sequence here in the type 2 coronavirus IRESs. And again, if you mutate away from that GNRA sequence, you lose the virus, uh, the IRES activity, all right? So this was back in 1996 that so these experiments uh, started, being, uh, started being done. And so again, we just form our uh, uh, 48S complex on our, on our um, in vitro transcribed EMCV IRES RNA. And this is what an experimental gel actually looks like. Not quite as nice as schematic. But what you can see here is that uh, this is basically like condition one here, where we've got no complex formed. And we, typically, we see this full length signal. All right? But now, when we form 48S complex, what we see are these two toe prints here. All right? This one here and this one here. All right? And these represent 48S complex that's formed on two ATGs that are very close together. At the, start, uh, at the start of the viral open reading frame. All right, so here you can see now we can detect 48S complex assembly. All right, and what we can do now is to start omitting some of these translation factors, all right, and to see what ones are actually needed. And here you can see once all these uh, translation factors are present, we see nice complex formation. Here was the first evidence that this protein, PTB, so the polyprotein tract binding protein, was directly able to stimulate the IRES activity. You can see here, the intensity of this stop is much stronger than this one here, okay? So this protein is not essential, but it stimulates the activity of the, of the IRES, okay? And then when we omit the EIF4F, we don't see anything. When we omit uh, other factors as well, we don't see any complex formation. So it means that this set of proteins are required for 48S complex assembly, right? And so this is quite novel at the time because a lot of people thought, right, these things, they're not going to work the same way as cap-dependent translations, so why would they use the same translation factors, all right? But this clearly demonstrated that the canonical set of translation factors were actually sufficient for these proteins to work, right? And that we had stimulation then by these, uh, this other protein, PTB, right? So PTB is uh, subsequently referred to now as this a class of proteins which are IRES transacting factors or ITAFs. All right? and so these are proteins not normally involved in translation but stimulate the IRES activity. Okay? So what you can also see here was this extra stop that is positioned here and you can see it more clearly here. But what you can see here is that if you get rid of EIF4F you lose this stop. Okay, so this stop, this whatever this stop is, either it's a change in structure or it's because the protein is binding to the RNA and arresting the reverse transcriptase. It seemed to be EIF4F dependent, right? So that was the first clue that this 4F protein, so either containing EIF4G or 4A, which we started as shown at the beginning, could actually directly interact with the viral IRS. All right. So what's this 4G protein? So 4G, it's a, it's, it's a very large protein, and we typically refer to it as a scaffolding protein, okay? Because it contains RNA bi or binding domains for EIF4A, which is the helicase part of this uh, complex, of the EIF4F complex, and here's the EIF4E binding position, but then the protein can also bind the poly-A binding protein, so PABP, uh, which is involved in circularization of messenger RNAs, and then the regulatory uh, factor uh, mink kinase, can also, it also is a binding site, all right? So what we found was that we were able to truncate EIF4G. So if we just clone out this middle fragment, which is able to bind EIF4A and EIF3, and you can see here again this toe print reaction. So here we have just the RNA only. Then all factors except for EIF4G. Again, we don't see any complex formation. But then when we add in the full length protein, we see nice complex forming here. But then these truncations, so either just this fragment here, you can see here, uh, so this is this one here. Again, we see beautiful 48S complex formation. And again, even if we truncate away the EIF3 binding site with these two fragments, we still see 48S complex formation, all right? So what it became clear is that it was just this middle fragment of EIF4G that was required for this IRES activity, all right? 
And this kind of makes sense, because now if you picture, if we show here, this is where the viral protease is cleave EIF4G. All right? So they get rid of this portion, so the protein can no longer interact with EIF4E and promote cap-dependent translation. But that doesn't impact its ability to promote viral iris translation. All right? So this is how the virus is able to compete with the cellular RNA. All right. So we then went on, uh, a long time later, to look at the type 1 iris uh, to see if we could do something similar to start pulling apart how that works. So this had been attempted many times, but it uh, didn't work out too well. Uh, so then I came on to the problem and started tackling it my way. Uh, and so just to, this is kind of in more detail what it looks like. So this, in the boxed region here, this is the minimal iris sequence. Okay, so if you start mutating any of these portions here, you lose iris activity. All right? But for a long time, people have been trying to reconstitute translation on the authentic AHCG, on the on downstream on this one, all right? and had been unsuccessful. So what I thought was, what if we try and reconstitute, first of all, on this ATG? All right? As I mentioned, so this is a very conserved ATG, but it's in a poor context. All right? So normally, the ribosome would never stop there. Okay? It, would, it would bypass this one, and then go down and start on this one. All right? So the first thing we did was to optimize this sequence here, to put it in a strong translation, uh, translation context. Now, a difficulty with studying these IRESs was that over, and, and it's re really because we didn't have these reconstitution system working, was over the 30 years that has been described, there's been a huge list of proteins that have been suggested to, uh, to stimulate iris activity, or to be essential ITAPs, the same way as PTB was able to stimulate EMCV. All right? But without being able to use the reconstitution system, it was very difficult to actually test this, uh, test, test this mechanistically. So there's a long list of proteins, including PTB again, the LA, LA protein, these proteins PCBP1, PCBP2, uh, the serine, uh, serine arginine rich protein 20, which is able to interact with EIF3, and, uh, and some other proteins, and it was thought it might act as a bridge to, to stimulate or to for, stimulate IRES uh, uh, activity. Uh, GARS, which is the glycyl tRNA synthetase. Uh, so a whole host of proteins, all right? But what's interesting about, well, what was obvious about all these proteins is that they're all RNA binding proteins, okay? And so a risk of these types of analyses is that you miss, uh, you miss, uh, you misidentify proteins through their ability to interact with this massive or structured piece of RNA. All right? So we went ahead and uh, tried to do this. And so we optimized the context. And so before we started, one thing that we had, uh, we had knowledge about was the ability of EIF4G and EIF4A to bind to this domain 5 of the type 1 IRSs, okay? So they're pointed, that's kind of suggested there was some similarity in the mechanism between the two types of IRS, all right? Uh, but apart from that, we didn't really know very much. And so we optimized the codon sequence here, and then we went through this, system, uh, through this reconstitution system again. As you can see here, in this first lane, you just have the RNA only, so that would be condition one again in our schematic. Then we add in all the canonical translation factors, and we see here, we don't see any 48S complex assembly. So then we expressed and purified a whole host of translation factor, I, or potential ITAPs that have been published in the literature over the years. And out of these, the only protein that actually seemed to stimulate 48S complex assembly was this protein, PCBP. Okay? So it's a poly-C binding protein. All right? And as you can see here, when we add in PCBP on top of the canonical translation factors, we now see stable 48S complex assembly. OK? So we went ahead. Uh, OK. And what was also interesting was uh, when we bound PCBP to the RNA, we always saw this stop again. So similar to what people saw before with the EIF4G iris interaction, we always saw this, uh, this stop, uh, stop forming. Now, other proteins we could clearly see were interacting with the viral RNA. For example, the LA protein, we can see a change in the apparent structure of the RNA. And again, this GARS protein, we also see these stops here. So this is indicative of the protein binding to the RNA or affecting its structure. But in none of these cases do we stimulate 48S complex assembly. All right? 
So then we went ahead, and again, now in the presence of PCBP, we were able to omit all of the other translation factors in order to start seeing what, uh, what's actually needed. All right, as you can see here, uh, EIS 2, 3, 4A, 4B, and 4G are all required, because without them, we don't get any 48S complex assembly, okay? In contrast, when we omit EIF1, we actually see a stimulation of 48S complex assembly on this ATG, all right? And then here, the M1 and 1A, we see uh, less of an effect, all right? So this was the first time that we were able to see exactly what's needed for this IRES to work, all right? But again, this is on the, not on the op, uh, authentic ATG. This was on the upstream one that was uh, optimized. So we went back into the full length system to try and see if now we could uh, see this uh, complex formation. And we could. So now we knew PCBP was required. We were able to try and optimize these conditions. But it turned out to actually get 48S complex assembly here, what we had to do was to optimize the salt concentration of the reaction. So it turns out that different IRESs, uh, when, once we went back and looked at the literature again, different IRESs uh, behave differently depending on the salt concentration uh, of the lysate or the cell. And it turns out that the type 1 IRESs are extremely sensitive to KCL concentration. And so by lowering it, so normally when we do these reactions, we try and maintain around 100 millimolar KCL, and that's su supposedly the, the, the physiological level of the, of the salt in the cell. Uh, however, what we did, what we had to do was to drop it. And we dropped it as much as possible. Uh, and I think if we dropped it further, you know, we'd probably see even more complex formation. Uh, but we're still not sure why that is. Uh, but then we went ahead and we looked at some other IRSs, type 1 IRSs, so this one here from the EV71, and then from Coxsackie virus. And again, we were able to stimulate 48S complex assembly on the authentic ATGs with PCBP2. So it turns out that PCBP2 is a critical ITAF for making these IRSs work, okay? And without this reconstitution system, we wouldn't have been able to demonstrate that. All right, so the next thing was to try and see where does PCBP2 interact with the RNA. And so we used a method called directed hydroxyl radical cleavage. And in this system, uh, we express protein in E. coli, and uh, we, we modify the protein with a reagent that binds to cysteine residues, all right? So it binds to cysteine residues, but it also has iron, it tethers iron to those cysteine residues. And we, uh, we, we add in hydrogen peroxide into the reaction, that iron generates free radicals. And those radicals then uh, hydrolyze RNA that's in close proximity, but they're very short-lived. So it's only when the protein is very close to the RNA that you get cleavage, all right? And so this is what one of these gels looked like. So we expressed all these mutants. And so what we did was we started with the wild-type protein, modified it, and then mixed it with RNA. And we saw all these extra bands appear in here compared to our RNA control, right? And so these are all sites of cleavage where the RNA is being cut by these, uh, by these cysteine residues, right? And so what we did then was we systematically removed the cysteines from the protein so then we could assign these cleavage positions to a particular cysteine, all right? And because we know the structure of these uh, domains of PCBP, we're able to assign where the protein is actually interacting with the viral RNA. And so when we map this onto the viral RNA, we could see that it bound to this large domain 4 at the top of the viral RNA. And it was critical on the, these C residues here and these C residues here. All right, so these two motifs are, rec are being recognized by two different domains of PCBP. And, it's, uh, and we're still not sure exactly what's happening, but we think PCBP might be restructuring the RNA in this region to allow this GNRA loop that I mentioned before to be presented in how it needs to be in order for the iris to function. Okay, so now we've got uh, an idea of uh, what factor requirements are needed for these irises. And so here we've got uh, EIF 4G and 4A bind into this domain here. And now we can add in PCBP bind into this region here as being critical. All right. And so what we're able to show is that the ribosome is recruited via the IRES to this region, but then scans normally once it's on the RNA. Because if we put in ATGs within this region, they get selected preferentially. Okay. 
So once the RNA ribosome is on there, scanning proceeds as it normally would. All right. So now that we've got these two systems working, we said, right, we know what's needed. Can we now start to get an idea of the, of the mechanism of, uh, of what's happening uh, between these two systems? And so this is the gel I showed you earlier, where we have different truncation mutants of EIF4G, all right? And again, on the type 2 EMCV IRAS. And in all cases, we're able to, uh, we're able to generate f stable 48 as complex formation. But when we did the same experiment with the type 1 IRAS, what we found was, as soon as we remove this EIF3 interaction site, we are no longer able to form 48S complex assembly. Okay? And so if we think back about the canonical translation system, the model is that this 4F complex binding to the cap of the 5' end then recruits EIF3 and the 43S complex to the RNA. Okay? So this data suggests that these two IRESs in this regard are behaving very differently. All right? So that this IRES, that this interaction between the IF3 and 4G is actually crucial, whereas in this case it's not. All right? And so we, did, we decided to test this. You know, is this the ability of uh, this interaction really crucial for these IRESs? And so we went back again to the directed hydroxyl radical cleavage experiment. Uh, I've referred to this as BABE because that's the moiety that you add onto the cysteine. Uh, but, um, so what we did was the purified EIF3 that we had from, uh, from the lysates, we babed the whole thing. So we have no idea what's been modified, uh, but we know that the, the any cysteine residues within this 13 subunit complex have been modified. All right? And what we found was when we incubated the protein, this EIF3 BABE protein with RNA, and performed a cleavage reaction, we saw nothing. We didn't see any sort of cleavage between, uh, the, uh, of the RNA by this babed protein. However, when we added in EIF4G into the reaction, we were now able to detect cleavage from EIF3. All right? So this is the first evidence that this EIF4G, EIF3 interaction was crucial for recruiting EIF3 in the translation complex to the RNA, to the viral RNA. All right, and so these uh, cleavages are located. So this is here. This, uh, this cleavage here is located at the top of this uh, domain four, and again, this se this cleavage here is located down here. Again, so this is one experiment, but just looking at different sec at different positions on the on the viral RNA. All right, but uh, and then this one, yeah. So what we found was once we used these truncated versions of EIFG, uh, EIF4G we no longer see these cleavage, uh, uh, cleavage th um, cleavages happening. All right? So this region here, this interaction, is essential for recruiting EIF3 and the 43S complex to the viral RNA. So we know that you enhance cleavage with EIF3, but what about the interaction of EIF3 with 4G? And what effect does that have on 4G's binding to the IRES? So we looked at it the other way. and so. We babed, modified our EF4G protein this time, and just used unlabeled EIF3. All right, and what we could see here was that in the uh, this these uh, cleavages here and here are coming from our EIF4G protein. All right, so that's our EIF4G interacting directly with the IRES. What we found was when we added in EIF3 into the reaction, we stimulated these cleavages, so we enhanced the cleavage, so we're enhancing the affinity of the uh, IRES uh, EIF4G interaction. All right? So there's some sort of res uh, reciprocal thing happening here, where 4G is required for EIF3 to uh, join the IRES, and EIF3 interaction then stimulates or stabilizes the interaction with the, uh, with the IRES. And again, here we showed that this was not just the case for poliovirus, but again, we saw similar results, this enhancement of cleavage by if you're, uh, for EV71. What's important is it really doesn't look like we see a change in the position of the cleavages. All right, so the cleavages are in the same position here and here and here and here, but it's just the intensity. So it, it doesn't look like it's changing the structure of the RNA. It's just that it's affecting the affinity for it. All right, but then when we did the same experiment with the type 2 IRES from EMCV, we see no enhancement of the cleavage. All right? 
So this sort of uh, reciprocal interaction between EIF3 and EIF4G is specific for the type 1 irises. All right? So again, that points to mechanistically, mechanistic differences between how they both work. All right? So now we can uh, start in, well, looking at these in, in, in with that information. We can see that uh, different, uh, fa uh, different factors are required to act as ITAPs. In the case of these eye guys, it's PTB. And here, we've got PCBP2. And, uh, but the key thing seems to be this interaction with EIF4A and EIF4G. All right? So uh, this is when I started to think, OK, this whole complex needs to work together in order to promote translation. All right? And this whole RNA here, this whole complex, needs to work together to promote translation. But what we had discovered in the meantime was a slightly different class of viral IRAs, which turned out to be sort of like a hybrid between these two. Okay? And so this is sort of starts to raise the question of modularity within these, uh, within these RNA structures. So this was, uh, this was a, uh, the 5' UTR from Aichi virus. Okay? And you might, it might uh, not jump out at you, but I'll highlight it. This region down here is basically identical to the EIF4G interacting region of the type 2 EMCV irises. All right? Whereas this region up here is more similar, or basically identical, to the type 4 uh, type four, uh, uh, to the uh, stem loop 4 of the type 1 polyvirus iris. All right? So suddenly, this whole idea of this whole thing having to work together is, th is thrown out the door. Okay? And so are these pieces of the RNA acting independently of each other in order to promote translation initiation? So again, just, uh, just zoomed in here, what we can see is this sequence here, which is essential for EMCV and FMDV IRAS activity is very highly conserved in the IG virus class of IRAS. Whereas this structure up here is very, very similar between the IHE and then, other, uh, and then the EV71. Now the key difference is this poly C tract is missing in the IHE like IRASs. Okay? But we still have the GNRA loop. All right? So these guys they don't seem to require PCPP2, or at least we, we, this, is, uh, this is what we thought. So we then went ahead and reconstituted again on the IHG IRS. And what we could see here was again, when we added in all our translation factors, we see very little 48S complex assembly. But then when we add in PTB, we start to stimulate complex assembly. All right? So again, PTB seems to be an ITAF for these guys, all right, similar to the EMCV IRES, which has a similar EIF4G to bind into men, right? What we also found here uh, was that a requirement for another protein called DHX29. So DHX29 is another RNA helicase that's involved uh, in normal cap-dependent translation on RNAs that have highly structured 5' UTRs, all right? And we could explain this requirement because the ATG on the ET virus IRES is trapped in this very stable stem. All right? So by destabilizing this stem, we were able to get rid of this requirement for DHX29. Okay? So if we just forget about the requirement for DHX29, it's there because uh, we, it's, it's needed. But the re key requirement is this stimulation by PTB plus the other translation initiation factors. All right? Uh, and so again, this is just to highlight this region here we don't see a requirement for PCBP2 in this case. All right? So although this structure is very similar overall, it seems the protein doesn't need, or the, uh, the iris doesn't need PCBP2 to bind in the way that the other type 1 irises do. All right? So if that's the case, then what about this GNRA loop? If our model is that the G, uh, PCBP2 binding activates the iris by exposing this GNRA loop, what happens in this situation? And to our surprise, what we found was, first of all, if we just delete the GNRA loop, either by chopping it here, either cutting off the whole top of this stem, or being a bit more drastic, 
in in vitro translation reactions in rabbit reticulocyte lysate, we're able to uh, we're able to completely inhibit iris dependent translation. All right, so this is a protein product that's uh, dependent on the iris activity. Okay, but what we found was when we made point mutations in the GNRA loop, which brought which moved it away from this GNRA sequence. We know, in contrast to both the type 1 and the type 2 irises, which strictly require this GNRA sequence, we, were, it, it's, it was, yeah, we did this about 15 times because I didn't believe it so many times. Uh, but it actually can stimulate the iris activity, mutating this GNRA loop sequence. All right? So, uh, so what this really, I think, suggests is that these modules are able to uh, are actually function independently of each other, all right? And that by recombining different elements of the IRES, we can still generate a functional IRES, okay? But it might be that certain modifications in how the, prote uh, how the IRES is functioning have to occur to allow that to happen. All right. Uh, yeah, okay, so in all cases, in all three cases, so this EIF4G, 4A interaction seems to be the key, the key initiation factor on all of these classes of IRES. But the subsequent details, what happens after that, seems to vary between the different IRESs. OK, so just to finish, uh, we're at a stage now where we can actually start to look at what the, some of these uh, interactions actually look like and try and Build, uh, build on the model of how these IRESs work. So what they've done is they've uh, solved the NMR structure of this region of the IRES, okay, of this uh, JK domain where we know EIF4G binds and interacts. And what they've found is that this uh, forms this beautiful, uh, the, these beautiful stem loops here. And there's this region here, which is, uh, it's called, it's, it's, I think it's called the accept, uh, activator stem loop. All right? And th uh, what they found was that EI4G, so then this is a SACS model uh, of the complex, was that this small fragment of EI4G bound within this region here, okay? And modeled in here, it binds between these two stem loops of the, the K domain, and so this is the stem that goes back to the rest of the IRES, okay? So it's binding and recognizing this sequence here, all right? And what this loop here is doing is it's actually holding the RNA in one specific conformation. All right, and so that goes back to uh, a question of a model like this. So you can think about things uh, about these interactions in a couple of ways, but the main the two main possibilities are that the viral RNA is unstructured, or maybe has stem loops, but is generally floppy, and is moving around, and it only acquires structure once it interacts with its binding partner, so EIF4G. All right, and that would be this model here. Okay. So it would be adaptive recognition. So the different parts of the IRES uh, uh, recognize the protein, and you get a stable conformation. All right? OK, but what would happen then is you can still have flexibility in the region of the IRES that is not uh, directly associated with its binding partner. All right? But what appears to be happening in the case of the, the IRES is that this activator stem loop here is stabilizing the conformation of the RNA. So the RNA has been presented in such a way that the protein can bind directly, all right? And so the heat domain, again, of EIF4G binds and interacts, all right? And so you can imagine, if this is a key interaction in stimulating the activity of this IRES, by having the RNA in this active, pre-organized conformation will allow the RNA to compete with EIF4G for any remaining translation that's going on in the cell, all right? And so this could be a mechanism for promoting the efficiency of IRES activity over CAP-dependent translation. All right, in summary, uh, I hope I've been able to uh, show you that, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, IRESs, I think, are absolutely fascinating because as much as we know about them, we still don't know how they work. And I think that's going to be an incredibly uh, important uh, thing to try and understand. Um, and also that these in vitro reconstitution systems that we've established and used to try and pull apart the mechanism are really powerful and are allowing us to get really good detail on these translation mechanisms. All right, now we're back to the question, sorry. So how do these elements recruit ribosomes? 
And are these structurally diverse IRAs is a common feature, a common mechanistic features? This is what I was waiting for. So, uh, the type, so I think I've shown you that the type 1 and type 2, type two IRAs is, they seem to be mechanistically distinct between this requirement for an interaction between EIF3 and EIF4G. But they share this key requirement for an interaction with EIF4G. All right? And it appears from our work with the Aichi virus IRAs is that distinct IRAs elements can be separated and put together in, uh, in, a, in, a, in different ways. However, it seems like it may be that uh, or there may be a requirement for compensatory changes elsewhere in the IRAs to allow it to function, uh, to function efficiently. And then the last question, how is the activity of some of these IRAs is altered in different cell types? We still don't know. All right? But what we can start to think is that some of these proteins that act as ITAPs, so IRAs transacting factors, the levels of expression or their availability in different cell types, because you know, we, we now clearly see that they're required for translation, may be able to affect the translation efficiency of the virus in different cell types. But this is still uh, really uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, investigations. And so finally, that just leaves me to thank Chris and Tanya, uh, in whose lab most of this work was done, and these guys who also contributed a lot to the IRAs work uh, that I presented today. And yeah, and so this is who I have current funding from uh, in my lab in Cambridge. Um, and so we're continuing on with aspects of IRAs translation, investigating how they work, uh, but also other mechanisms of virus translation regulation, but also how the cell is trying to prevent uh, virus translation as well. Um, so once some more papers come out, I might come back and tell you about that. Thanks. <laughs>